Hello, and welcome to episode four of our video series about creating a complete app builder using the Find Toolkit. Hopefully you've been enjoying this series so far, which is published each Thursday afternoon, that's UK time. Be sure to subscribe if you haven't already. Things are about to get pretty exciting. In the previous video, we created our setup wizard and the basic project creation code. So now we can open this app and then use it to create a new empty project or an existing one like we set up in a previous episode. Since then, I've tidied the code just a little bit. Uh, I added a custom font and updated the toolbar a little bit to show the project information. So let's jump into the code just there before we continue. So as you can see, I have a simple font function here for our custom theme. I added some Poppins font resources using the same bundling method that we covered in episode one. And that's going to mean that we're using a font specific to our application instead of the system default. And for the toolbar, I added a new canvas text with the foreground color that's bold. And that's going to display app creator to start with, but then it's going to update to the application name when we load the, the project, sorry, when we load the project. Uh, and that's going to be using this data binding that we set up before. I'm adding a listener so that when the loaded project changes, then we can get the name and then set that to the text and refresh. That means it's just a little bit clearer which project we're editing and we don't need to rely on the title bar. So we can actually just run those changes uh, and this is going to load the project as it exists. You can see it says app creator. And if I open an existing project that I have set up, um, just in my temp folder here, then it's going to update with a much more prominent name because this temporary text that we had is going to go away. And the title bar may not be present on every system that you use. So yeah, that was the changes since last time. But a few people have reached out and asked if the code that we're using is going to be available. Um, well, yeah, I'm really excited to say that that is the case. In fact, you can check out the code now and follow along the tutorials. If you go to our GitHub repository at FineLabs, you'll see there's a new project called Fission Tutorials. And that is where you're going to find the latest code. We've tagged each of the episodes, ep one, two, three, and we'll add that going forward so that you can check out the code for a particular episode of the video tutorials. But the project itself will always be at the latest version. So if you want to follow along, then you can head over there and do just that. Anyhow, for today's video, I wanted to move on to the visual components of our main UI and fill out some of the blank areas. So you'll remember when we set up our project initially, as we just saw actually, there's a few blank areas. We called them left and right. And then of course the center content is this gray rectangle. I'm gonna see what we can do to fill those out today. The first one I wanted to look at is the left hand file panel. What we want to include here is a list of the files that we're working with. But more than just that actually, um, we're going to want to show the areas of the application. So there's kind of mixed content going in there. Um, and so instead of a simple file tree, I'm going to put uh, an accordion, an item that allows you to show different areas uh, and expand and contract them. I will put a file tree at the top of them. Um, and actually we'll, we'll just leave it there for now. The, the next panel would be um, screens, I suppose. Um, but we can leave that blank at the moment. But let's get started with a new accordion. Uh, and that has accordion items added into it. So new accordion item files would be the first one. And that needs um, a tree inside it. We'll do that in a moment. And then new accordion item screens is the one I'm going to come back to. So we'll just put a, a label in there and reminding us for another time. So this tree, actually let's call it um, 
files might be a little bit more descriptive. Files is going to want to be a new tree. And at this point, we could just use a regular tree where we have to handle all of the data ourselves. We could use a helper called new tree with strings, and that allows us to display static content where we have a map of strings. Uh, it could be really useful in some situations, but given that we learned a bit about data binding last time, I think we should do the same here. And in find 2.4.0, there's a new type of data binding, which is a tree, a data tree, as you can see here. So we're going to make use of that so that we can manipulate the contents of our tree without having to know the widget that's being used. So we need the um, tree data is the first thing. And then I can see here, we need a create item, an update item, a callback. So this might be a little bit confusing, I suppose. We're not just setting up a simple widget with static content or standard widgets because trees can hold a lot of data like lists and tables. This is a callback based widget. So it's going to ask us first to tell it how we create a new item. That's what it's going to need uh, to use every time it creates an item, which is then going to be cached. And the second parameter is update item, which is the function that's going to be called when it's pulled an item out of a cache and it's going to apply data to it. So first we call the create item, sorry, we create a create item, which takes a Boolean parameter, and that is whether or not it's a branch. <clears throat> and that is going to return a, a canvas object so that it could be used in the cache. And I always actually forget which way round this Boolean is. And the parameter, it, yeah, it's whether or not it's a branch. Remember, you can always step into the definition of the code to see what actually is going on. And then we need the update, which takes the um, data item. That's the item inside the tree that we're being passed, the same branch boolean, and the canvas object that will be reused. Binding data item, the branch boolean, and the object to reuse. Not a problem. And we don't return anything from there. We just um, put the code in here. So we need to think about what it is that we're going to do inside the tree. Um, well, let's just start with a, a simple display of file name, I suppose. So we use a label um, and for the template, um, so this is what determines how much space is reserved for the widgets basically, we will simply say uh, file name, uh, JPEG perhaps. That's indicative of the type of content that we're going to use. And now we know the content is going to be a label, we can um, update or cast I suppose the object that we're being passed. So we're working with the right type. We're going to want to set the text of this label, but we don't know, um, I suppose, what the text is. So we're going to get from the data binding, the item, and that would be data.get, which we saw before. But what type of data is it that we're going to be binding to? A tree of that type of data is what we need to, to define. So we saw before when we were working with the files and the folders that these are URIs and listable URIs. That's uniform resource identifiers. It means that we can reference data items um, on any platform without assuming that it's from a file system, which would be a dangerous thing to do in a cross-platform system. So we could set up that tree data by using data binding with a new URI tree. So the tree that I mentioned, the data binding tree, has all the standard types that Fine assumes 
Um, so we can use the direct type here in the constructor. That's probably all we need to do. Now that we know it's a, a URI tree, we can assume or even assert that the data item is a URI. Um, and then get the data out of it. So that's going to be URI. And I think we could probably ignore the error. Again, more robust code might be careful to make sure that that's not um, assumed. But for now, let's go ahead. And from a URI, we can get the file name by calling the name function. And so we can set the text to name. That's pretty straightforward. That is our tree setup. But this tree data isn't going to be accessible from anywhere else. So let's make sure that we can update that separately. Instead of creating the tree data here and it doesn't go anywhere, we need to set that into our type um, scope, the, the GUI type. So here we're going to want the file tree um, to, so that it's accessible from elsewhere. And that's from um, binding URI tree. That's an interface, so we don't need this little uh, star here. Now that we've got it there, we won't call it tree data here. We will assign that to g.filetree um, and use that as the parameter to our tree with data binding. So now what's in the bound data is always going to ref be reflected by the visualization of that tree on screen. So we need to do something about putting data into it. So let's look at how we open a project. Uh, this function here is currently handling the not so hard work. Let's just take that out of the GUI code because realistically it's probably more related to projects. So we'll pop it back into project.go. It's currently getting the name of the directory, assuming that's the project name, and setting it through data binding to the title of our project. And so now we're going to want to do the equivalent for all of the files. So what we need to do then is to iterate over all of the files in that directory. Um, so we can call a uh, directory.list. And you can see that returns a slice of URIs and an error. Now we have just opened that directory, so the chance of it being a problem, returning an error, is slim. I think in this case, if I had a little bit more time, I would probably be putting some error handling in there. But let's just skip right over that for now. And then we're going to want to uh, iterate over that, I suppose. So um, for each of the URIs, we don't need the index. In the range of items, we're going to want to do something with each of them. And in this case, uh, we just want to append it to the tree, I suppose. So we can call append. And because it's a tree, appending is a little bit more complicated than if it was just a list binding. We need to know the parent that it was attached to, so it knows where to go um, underneath. Um, the ID that it has and the value. And those are important because the ID in a tree is universally unique, um, but the value doesn't have to be. And the way that the tree mapping is worked out is with the parent to child ID relationship. So the, the parent wants to be the root. Um, the binding package is uh, defining that for us, the data tree root ID. Uh, you could take a sneaky look at that uh, it's actually just the empty string, but it's good to have named types rather than just constant um, values passed in as parameters. Then the ID, which has to be unique, well, that's going to be our URI, um, we'll convert it to a string, but that's just going to, yeah, basically write the URI in its full form. Um, and then we can pass the URI itself as the value because it is um, expected to be that we have a URI data binding in, in the tree that we've set up. So um, I think that's probably everything that we have there. Uh, yeah. 
We've opened the project, we're setting the name and we're loading the items of the tree. Now the eagle-eyed person here might realise that all we're doing is setting the root items to the project. We can just make a note of that so that once we have more complex projects we put them into the file tree correctly. But uh, let's just run that and, and see how far we get. So we have our accordion here with files and screens. Let's create a new project this time. Um, call it testing. I'll just put it in my home directory. Oh, goodness me. I'll put a second one in my home directory. Testing 2 is in both of these places still. And if we expand files, you'll see that it has a go.mod. Excellent. Now, I think the files panel should probably be expanded by default. So we can fix that when we're setting up. Not a problem at all. One other thing that occurred to me, however, is that we're just appending. So if we then open another new project, for example, the one that we just created, testing two, yeah. So we've got a little glitch in here because we've added another item with the same unique ID. So the tree can't figure out what's going on. That's our fault, really. We shouldn't have done that. We need to reset this tree binding because if we just keep appending, then it's not really keeping that uniqueness. So really what we want to do is to reset it. And we can do that just by calling set. I will pass in empty everything. So the IDs, a mapping of string to a slice of strings, and the values, which is a map of strings to URIs. So we can just uh, pass, pass in that. And there, map of string to URIs. And I suppose we could even comment there, just to make it clear what's going on. I don't know that comments are really excellent most of the time, but in this case, it's a single line. It's not worth creating a whole new function to handle that, but it's not necessarily obvious what it's doing. So let's go back and set up the accordion to be expanded. So we created it here, we called it um, left. And so we can just um, uh, expand, no, um, open. We pass it an index, uh, zero indexed, I'm assuming, and that will open the first item, which is the files panel. So let's just try that again. Let's open, yeah, project testing two. And the panel was open. The mod is showing there. And we'll try once again to open the same project. And we'll just force a quick refresh on the tree just in case. And you can see that issue was resolved as well. Well, there you go. So that's our files panel basic code set up with data binding. Next, we should move on to this main UI area here. I know that we don't have a visual element loaded in our project yet, but I thought it would be good to just show um, some more real content in this panel here. If we briefly go back to the design mock-up that we were working from earlier, you could see this main panel is made up with a preview of the application and a switcher here that allows you to choose which platform it's being previewed on. We just created the very basic structure on here already and I would like to do the same. Now, this mobile screen has some complexity to it, but because we're building for multiple different platforms, I thought it would be useful just to show a very quick preview of the application on the current platform, because that's you know how the theme and everything is set up by default. So let's drop that in, um, and we'll use a new feature uh, in Agile Find Development, not in one of the released versions yet, 
um, called an inner window. Let's just see first how you can use an unreleased version of the fine code. So we will use go get, like we did at the very beginning, to install fine. Uh, it was fine.io slash uh, fine. Slash, it's still v2, the major version, but instead of at latest, we'll say at develop, which is going to get, oh goodness, sorry, go get. That's going to get the very latest version of the code that the team are currently working on. So that might just take a little moment to download. Excellent, so you can see it upgraded from the released 2.4.0 to an unreleased 2.4 something above zero. So now we have access to that new feature. Instead of our content, let's work on the items that are going to be visible. Uh, so that was passing in, ah yes, this new label uh, with data. We don't need that anymore. We've replaced it with the, the item in the, in the header bar. Um, and here we're going to want the um, preview. Um, but also we want the item, the, the select item at the top left. So really we are looking for something in the middle, something in the edge. Well, this is, this is a great time for border again. So uh, the, let's call this preview with a um, container new border. New border, yeah, okay. The top will be the um, picker, and then um, there's nothing at the bottom or the left or the right, and the content, we're looking to have the inner window and the content, but we don't want it to fill the space. We want it to just be um, centered. So we'll say new center, um, and that will be the, um, the window. Yeah, okay, that's cool. So the inner window that I mentioned, we can use that now just with the widget, um, the, where did it go? Into the container package. Yes, the inner window is a container. New inner window, there you go. Um, an inner window has a, a title, much like an, an outer window. Um, the name of the app, we, we do know the name of the app, don't we? It's the, uh, yeah, it's the title, um, which is, Ooh, where did we access that before? Iron ah, in the banner. The name, ah yes. The title of the project. So we can use that name there. And the content, well this of course is where things start to get a bit more complicated. We will put a live preview of the app that we're developing, uh, but for now we'll just use another label like I've been using as a placeholder many times before. New label. A preview here. So we should have a window border around a label and then we want the picker. Um, so the um, picker really it's a select yeah a new select which takes a slice of strings uh, for the options available and then a function so that we are told which one has been chosen. Let's just start with um, desktop, generic I suppose, and then we can add other things like uh, iPhone 15 Max, which we can figure out how to emulate later. And that um, callback will take a string, um, but we don't do anything with it just yet. So that's our picker. Um, but this is going to fill along the top of the border. Actually, I don't want it to be full width. We want it to be just be top left. Um, so let me put that into a horizontal box so it stays all the way over. New H box. That's the preview bar. The content there is set. Um, yeah, and then those dividers are setting up our UI as before. 
Okay, well, let's just give that a blast and see if it comes along okay. It can take a little while to compile once you've brought in a, a upgrade like the moving to develop here, uh, but we're doing okay today. Oh, so something's there. Uh, let's just, um, again, open uh, our little project. And there you go. This is the app preview here window. Oh, that's pretty cool. This inner window that I mentioned has a close button and the other buttons are, are disabled, I suppose. There's not really anything hooked up to it, but close will dismiss it. So let's resolve that because we don't want it to go away. And this is our drop down. But really, we wanted to show desktop right away because that's what's being displayed. And it's right up against the edge, which I don't think is particularly good. Um, so let's go in and just address those things. The picker here, um, we want to fix that um, to, so that the selected is already set to be desktop. And the close button of the inner window well, we can, like on a main window, we can set a close intercept so that we're told when the window's going to be closed. Like when somebody's tapped on the close button, you might want to save a document or offer some dialogue pop-up. In this case, we literally want to do nothing. So I'm just going to save that there um, and it, it just won't close. If we wanted to do something and then close it, you might have seen this before, um, but you could do um, something here and then if you call close on the window, then that's going to go ahead and dismiss it like you would expect uh, with the default behavior. And the last thing was to pad this border in. Uh, so this preview is the border layout. So we can um, just pop that into a padded container. Oh, just disappeared. And that should resolve the um, how close it is to the edges. Let's give that let's give that a go. There we go, it's it's in from the edge. It has desktop there. Uh, let's just open that project again. The app preview's here, and we can't close it. You'll notice this is right in the center. Because we've used a, a layout that is the center layer, it's always going to stick in the center, which is pretty handy. And so there we have the basic layout of the files panel. Um, we should probably look at this accordion because it's only allowing one open at a time. Let's get to that. Our select doesn't do anything yet, but of course we're going to come back to that as well. And this right panel, it looks a bit mm, uninspired. So let's put some more content in there just before we're done. But um, let's fix them accordion um, so we don't want it to be only one at a time <clears throat> so where did left go here it is so we've opened the zero one um, but we can also say multi open so that opening one doesn't close another and then the last item is what to do about this right hand panel uh, well, not a lot right now because that's to do with the editor that's opened. We don't really have um, editors yet. I hope it's not too much of a spoiler to say we're coming onto that very soon. But instead of a boring label that says right, let's make it look like something is going to be there. Um, the settings panel possibly is, is going to be the first one from that preview we had. Um, but just empty text or regular size text doesn't look too great. So let's put some um, semantic meaning, make a, a header instead. So we can use the rich text to make something a little bit more um, rich. And there's a helper actually um, to do from Markdown. So if we then um, pass in some Markdown uh, that says settings at an H2 level, then we should have something a little bit more attractive in our right hand panel. So let's uh, just run the application uh, one last time. Uh, we'll see what's happening. And there we have it. We've got our kind of heading sized text over there. Let's just open that project again. And we can see this is all laid out as before. And when we expand screens, ah, there we go. 
it's not collapsing the other one. So we can have multiple panels open at the same time. Excellent. So that was pretty much all that I hoped to cover today. But we got through it pretty quickly. So let's go back to this files panel and look at what happens when we add a directory. So if I just sneakily put a directory into that test project, testing to test, make a, make a directory there. Let's just see what happens. There we go, there's a test project and it is displaying. Great, okay, so it's showing up. And then if we put a file inside that, called, I guess, <laughs> test.txt, and try one more time. This, I suppose, is where we might get a little bit disappointed. This tree isn't really much of a tree. So let's just address that while we're here, instead of having that to do hanging around here. So what we did first time round is we iterated through the directory and added everything to the root of the tree. But really what we want to do is to be a little bit smarter and um, after appending that, we probably want to see um, if the, um, uh, if the URI can list, which means it's a directory. We saw that before when we were working with opening projects. So if the URI can be listed, then what are we going to do about it? Well, firstly, I suppose we could handle that error. It doesn't feel like it's a, a fatal error, so let's just log it for now. Again, we're in a project that we knew was listable. Um, so the highest probability is that everything that um, in, is inside it can be checked for whether it could be listed. So I'm not too worried about that, but it is an important failure if it, if it happens. But if it does um, return that it can be listed, we're not able to do anything here because we're inside a simple function. So let's just take out the to-do and figure something smarter. So really what we want to do is add um, files to tree. The tree that we're adding them to, uh, actually let's pass the, the directory really, is what we're, we're thinking. The directory's files should be added to the tree. And it's going to want to know where in the hierarchy to add them. So that's when we start with the root Think. So if we then factor this out to the missing function, add files to trees, so I already guess what we're doing, um, but we're going to want to pass in the, um, the listable URI, the tree, the URI tree, and the root. So that is, um, tree node ID. That's the type. It's really just a type of um, string. Uh, is that? Oh no, that's when we're dealing with, with tree widgets, the um, tree type, here I tree, um, binds strings, just generic strings. Sorry about that. So really, in our project here, the root is just a string. I guess that, that makes sense. It's um, a generic data type, essentially. So for each of the directories, we're going to list it like we did before. And for each item, we're going to append it to the tree, which is now just um, named tree. That's still quite straightforward. The root is no longer always actually the root of the tree, but the root that we pass in 
which starts at the root of the tree, but then we have the opportunity to step into it. So when this is a directory, what we want to do is add files to tree. Um, really, it's the, the URI that we're currently using that we want to pass in. The tree is the same, but the root is this ID here. So let's just take that out. Um, actually, we can call it ID, node ID. Um, just to save creating the string from a URI twice. Um, and that should be, sorry, if is directory, which I think is a slightly better variable name than yes. And lastly, this URI is not necessarily a listable URI. We've checked that it is listable, but it isn't of the right type. So just like we did before, we're going to get the lister for the URI, um, which will return, oops, sorry, pass in the URI, returns the directory listing. And just one last time, I am going to ignore the error. Uh, Actually, let's not overwrite dir. That could be confusing. So let's create a new one called child. So now, instead of just iterating once, we are recursing into the directory. So as we go through, it's going to look at the child item of um, any directory that it encounters. Uh, that would be an excellent place for a unit test like I said last time. Um, but for now, we'll just run this code, open the project, and now our test is clearly a folder with a test.txt file inside it. It's There's no icons, it doesn't look particularly fancy, um, but you can see that it's working, and we can come back to make improvements on that in a future video. Well, I think that really is a wrap here. Hopefully you have enjoyed playing with some of the widgets here and the data binding in a more complex use case. Do be sure to um, subscribe to the video feed or come find us again next Thursday when we'll be focusing on um, displaying different file previews and editors so that when we click on items in our tree, it actually displays some, some real content, not just the, the mock-up that we use today. And don't forget, if you would like to learn more about what we're building, you can have a look at fission.app, which uh, this week has a shiny new theme. You can find out more by going to the links about the documentation or heading to the video feed to catch up on any that you have missed. And don't forget, if you're interested to test the application that we're demonstrating how to build, just pop your email in here and we will be in touch and let you know when there's a space available on the alpha test. Thanks so much. Enjoy building and I will see you next time.